Cheers. Cheers. Thank All you, right. Anthony from No Bullshit Watchmaker. Everyone, my name is Henry Lee of the Watchmaking Project. I'm here with Heinrich Corpola from uh, KHWCC uh, from the Lockley, Switzerland. Um, obviously, Mr. Corpola needs no introduction, but I'm still going to have a new introduction. Um, so, myself, uh, I don't want to go too much into it, but I run a small, very small private service center uh, in uh, New York. And obviously, uh, everyone knows uh, No BS Watchmaker. He has such a following and such clout in the industry. Um, he has a Amazon number one or two uh, book out, so please check that out. And without further ado, I'm gonna let Henry Corpola kind of give a bit information about his background, biography, where he came from, what he was doing, how what led him to here and be here today. All right, yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, a little bit background, maybe yes. if, uh, people don't know so much about me. Um, I come from Sweden. I learned the watchmaking in the Swedish watchmaking school. It has transformed into uh, another school today, but uh, more or less the same. Um, I worked also in Sweden for three years. Okay. Uh, learned the basics of watch repair, a little bit of restoration skills as well, and clocks, uh, which was very, very good experience. I moved quickly over after three years to, to Switzerland, Zurich, to learn the modern uh, watch production for a, a company called Ventura at that time. Uh, they are probably still running um, with, uh, with new watches. Uh, so he's being modest, right? And Ventura, he was kind of the head kind of production manager of... I, sta I started as a junior, uh, yeah. just at the production. Uh -huh. uh, what was very surprising was the level of cleanliness that was required in a Swiss watch at that time. And I appreciated very, very much what I learned there. Uh, even though that it wasn't the most expensive product, uh, it was a really interesting uh, learning curve uh, and, and really dif different from uh, Swedish watchmaking because it's new watches so you have to be you, they have to be extremely clean okay and I struggled a lot in the beginning but I got the hang of it and uh, learned another skill three years later I went to Wasta uh, as a student at first so uh, before that the interest in being a watchmaker in Switzerland encouraged you to go delve deeper find go to essentially the Harvard of watchmaking schools is most yeah right? yeah so he he, he had, there was something he there was an itch he wanted to scratch and you yeah. essentially went I have been, working I have so been, did you save exactly. any money when you went for it or you just like I'm gonna quit my job I want to do all this stuff like what was your process behind it, that? it was always uh, the same in in Sweden I saved for three years uh, wherever I worked I didn't <laughs> get a very very high salary okay and it took me three years just to, to save the money to get the, the, the ticket for the, the air uh, airfare or whatever. Okay. And then I got there and it was the same thing in, uh, when I worked in, in Zurich. It took me three years to get the uh, funding, to get the money enough to pay for the refresher course, which was my big, big dream. I didn't think I would get it that early. Uh, six years after the Swedish watchmaking school, I was already a student in Boston, which was huge highlight in yeah, my career. I mean, every watchmaker, if they had a chance, Wolfstep is the yeah, place they yeah, go. Uh, it's a Harvard of watchmaking schools. That's the, the, what is it, the Hogwarts, essentially, of the watch industry. Yeah, yeah, right? it's, it's the, the main uh, It's the reference. main place that yeah, everyone yeah. refers to, right? Exactly. So, yeah. Now, Heinrich, what, what's your recommendation to someone that actually wants to get into watchmaking and is in that position where um, they want to learn watchmaking, but they're, they don't live in an area where watchmaking is, is hot? I, I think the most important is that you have the passion and you really want to do it and never give up this passion no matter no matter where you are in the world uh, because there is a thousand and one different ways to get into watchmaking some people don't even go to the school and they are great watchmakers it, yeah. they might take later on some courses with AWCI or some short courses in Boston or even in my school now uh, which I have uh, right. So never ever give up your dream. So if you have the dream, there are solutions wherever you are in the world. Now your average time to learn in a watchmaking school is about two years, give or take. That um, has become kind of the standard, yeah. Yeah, and I think you have a program out that's... Um, two years also. Two it's years. a it's an intensive two year since I want to... I want the students to get really the maximum. When I was in Sweden, it was three years. So when he means two years maximum, it's a two year intensive course yeah, in yeah. watchmaking. So it's a full skill course where a person comes in who has rudimentary hand skills, hand-eye coordination, um, and it's developed into, um, the, the, the become developed into the tactile watchmaker that can respond to modern day's needs 
for either vintage watch, like a complicated watch, uh, a modern timepiece, like you name it, the watchmaker will come out of a full course can do this, right? But it, some courses, like be wary, some courses can do it, some courses can't. Like just make sure you do your research, right? It's important you look who you're learning from, who the source of the knowledge is coming from. And, um, and you know, do your own research. Well, I've already taught most of them too. I know, and I know you're getting to there. I know you, you're instructed over Yeah, so let, let's take a step back. So let's let's take, let's, that so was just a brief segment. Let's go back to the so step back. To so, yeah. so right now, he at this stage, we segued from something else, but going back to what you're saying, you were yeah, in, yeah. you were taking a refresher course. I took the refresher course, step. which was, yeah, that was the, the, the highlight, I guess, of my career, actually. Uh, it was a and uh, it was a wonderful course, five months long, super intensive. It 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 when I look back on it, it it reminds me of like uh, when I watch videos of the training of uh, uh, yeah or, or, or Navy SEALs in America. It, it's really that in, it was really that intensive, and uh, but for uh, on the watchmaking level, of course, not physically like yeah. like, uh, but and it it also bonded us together. We were I think. 10 or 11 students at the time uh, in this course. We even we even printed out a, a, a t-shirt at the end of the course. <laughs> we survived was the this and that course wow. and then it was all the names with the flags of the student. It was a ma totally magical period. Uh, it was five months, five months intense. Five, five months and I mean we, it, 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 we were like monks. We were there all the time. We went there early morning, 7 so, o'clock or whatever. Another setback. Wilson has his policy. If you're taking a course the school's open for you as a student to do whatever you want to do, right? And it's important because it fosters creativity. It fosters the student who, who, who essentially is kind of living their dream to ensure that they're pursuing their passion in a 100% way where the school's there, equipment's there, everything's there for them before school and after school. Because class starts at 8 o'clock, 8.30, I believe. It starts at 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock. They, come, 8 we, they all arrived at Way early, six thirty, like, seven. Yeah, like everyone comes yeah, like two yeah. hours early. Yeah. They leave two hours later, yeah, and I yeah. keep from experience. Like I, you know, I, I I did a course there, and as I was going out, I saw students still like working. And it, it was because the, the students who came there, they felt that this is a very, very precious moment in their life, that they only get one time in their it's life. It's a once in a lifetime experience yeah. to be able to do this. Really? So everyone, I mean, everyone I spoke to who did a refresher course, yeah. they were there essentially like. It was 10 hours a day, 10 hour, 12 hour days. And then Saturday, and B, I would have, was there every Saturday and Sunday as well, oh actually. Yeah. So it was really like almost seven days a week. Seven, so it's probably 70, 80 every, hours every a week. It depends yeah. on the individual. There are people yeah, who yeah. go oh, there. Sure, sure. And they, they're like, okay, I'm here like, from eight to five. Yeah. And they, like, it's yeah. like a, some people, so I only way I can equate to some people who work a job, right? They come yeah. in, yeah. they swipe nine yeah. o'clock, yeah. they leave five o'clock, right? Yeah. Yeah. But if you're passionate about what you're doing, work is not work. Exactly, this is just right. a passion. It's, it's, a it's passion. A fun. You want to yeah. know more, like you know, like watchmaking. You were there for like just. Let, I want to finish his story, and I want to <laughs> let him know what he, what I feel his experience. So five yeah. months refresher course or wool step, and then what Which happened? Then you go from there. My teacher at that time was Paul Madden, a wonderful teacher. He's actually he went back there and he's teaching there now. Oh, okay. um, and he noticed that I uh, suddenly in my spare time or, or on the side I, I was suddenly starting to to help other students okay. with what I have understood and then I started to help other oh this is how you, you measure this and that in timing or whatever yeah. and he noticed that so at the end of the course they had was to ask me oh would you like to, uh, to uh, work here teach here oh, shoot. And my plan was absolutely not to be a teacher. Uh, I decided lo I decided when I was like eight years old that that's not the job I want to have uh, to teach because it looks really scary and um, embarrassing and so on. Oh, man. So uh, yeah, and you got a knack for teaching though. So. Yeah, uh, uh, luckily it also became later a passion for me. But yeah. my goal was actually to go uh, to try to become hired by Christoph Clary and learn the more complicated and exotic 
mechanical type pieces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's everyone's biggest dream, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, because everyone's stuck working on mechanical pieces. Exactly, but you know, if Volstead asks you that question, it's not that you can say no. You can't. I mean, you you just can't. You just have to take it. Who doesn't want to? It's like Harvard asking you. We need someone to teach here. Would you be Would you be able to teach? You, you, yeah, you have yeah, to say yes. Yeah, right. Exactly. Even if and and how long did it last? Were we courses? Were we teaching? Like, I mean, I know a lot of people who left for professional courses under this guy, right? A lot of people who work in the industry now who are pretty high up in technical positions in in the watch industry. Yeah. So this guy is almost. I mean, I don't want to say teacher of teachers, but he's at this stage. I feel like he is. So, yeah, but yeah. continue. Going back to so what, what I did was uh, so so I uh, I took the uh, uh, was a profession course myself, and uh, directly after I became the assistant uh, to Stephen McDonald at time that time. Uh, and Steve McDonald's is complication. He was also the teacher in the complication course, course. and I think he also made um, one of the products for Maximilian Busser and friends. The, um, he was uh, the very very design. impressive. Uh, Perpetual calendar he made for them, designed for them. Oh, yeah. And, but, but going um, back to that, so, so there was a short period in Mosa where complication courses were being taught. Yeah. In, in adjunction to refresher course, all these other short courses, and it was only for that time period because it, that time period can't be reproduced because of. I don't want to say this, but the complication course I felt was ego driven. It was very. It was up to the to whoever was the instructor of yeah, how yeah, the material yeah. can turn out. Because you were given a watch, yeah, and you were saying make, a client's watch, make this work. Yeah, a client's watch. Also. Yeah, yeah it, so was, it was like, it, no, was like, it was high pressure environment. It, it was more. Course. It felt a little bit more like uh, that course felt a little bit more like you have to prove yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah, um, yeah. Uh, because they use also real clients watches yeah. actually, and you can't fail. Which was good. I'm not saying it's bad. So they took a bunch of watchmakers and they essentially made them the diamonds, right? They pressured them to the point where the growth was inevitable. And now these people are leading the industries in, in technical advances in where we are today. They probably got a lot of key positions in the industry. Yeah, they, as managers key or positions, or they, they own their own places. Or they, they are independent watchmakers yeah. and so on. Yeah. 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 So go Very back to the, so after you finished French course, he began hiring, you began to teach professional courses. Yeah, I became first an uh, uh, um, assistant under Stephen McDonald. Okay. Uh, just to learn the um, style, the style teaching of teaching methods. and see him uh, actually teach, okay. which was really, really interesting. Um, and then uh, after that uh, refresher course, I did my own too. So I did uh, two subsequent uh, refresher oh, courses sure. after that. So you did two refresher courses back to back? Yeah, yeah, oh, wow. yeah okay. exactly. Cool. And that's after that... Uh, some uh, one of my students because it goes in it's like a heritage so the last one that I took I also recognized there is somebody here in this class who has to take over my position mm -hmm. and at that time it was Andrea Kola I, I felt that he was like the absolute perfect the candidate to, to, take to take over, over my uh, uh, my position there and, and where, did you go, where did you go from uh, and after that uh, I took the complicated course uh, turning course shopping course uh, escapement course and uh, other other courses as well uh, train the trainer course basically I took all the watchmaking courses that were available at that time oh. he, was, he, was he was living the watchmaker's dream essentially yeah yeah right okay. and uh, yeah that was actually it was so so brilliant at that time and I mean, you can imagine um, it, it felt kind of unreal uh, yeah right? yeah you're, you're for sure living your yeah. dream you're teaching yeah you're teaching, teaching and learning the courses you're learning I mean yeah. Very academic, really academic, nice world of uh, of learning to understand so, the true. So, how things. long was your tenure? How long were you at Wolsta for? The entire duration. Uh, like the entire duration felt probably like fifty years or something, but it was only five years in then. But that's very long in Wolsta Nushatown. Yeah. But Andrea, he has beaten my my record long, long time ago. Yeah. He has survived like oh, 10, 15 years. So I, I don't know. He's there very, very long time now. Okay. But so at that time, it was really high power or high charged and. To, to survive more than five years would not be easy for anybody. But after all these courses I took, it led up to me teaching the complete uh, training, the two-year course. Oh, okay. Then so, the um, yeah, then I did uh, uh, teach the full training. With, uh, How many times did you teach the full training? Only one time. Only one time. 
and um, and o I already knew when I started to teach it that this is the, my last course because that uh, means that now I've been there five years and it's perfection. You, you, I end it like you this. You felt it was time for growth. Yeah, it was time to move right. on after so five years. You 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 kind of accepted the knowledge that was given to you. Yeah, and that it's time for you to take it and essentially make it your own, absorb it, and grow from it. Yeah, yeah. Bruce Lee quote, baby. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then okay. now I had all that yeah. knowledge, so yeah. it felt like natural. That the now next step is to grow from it. Right? Yeah, and take yeah. this, make it your own. How do you deliver what you've learned from the years' experience of working and teaching and learning into future generations of watchmakers? Yeah, yeah. And also at that time, actually, I was working for a Swiss watch manufacturer when I was doing the, the, okay. the all the courses. Who you, do you can you say who you were? Normally, I can I, I can't officially say it because okay. everyone who works with these companies they have an NDA, so uh, because they are supposed okay. to do it on their own. But in Switzerland at that time, there were a lot of subcontractors that helped mm. uh, so to produce it. Yeah, I was a subcontractor because there was so much production at okay. the time. I know the company's talking about. It's a really high-end brand. Trust yeah. me, it's it, like yeah. it produces top-notch stuff that ends up on people. Yeah, yeah, Bruce. and that that I did, did uh, after uh, my general study uh, teaching in Vostep. At uh, I went home at five six o'clock, and then I continued to produce these watches uh, until so, ten so eleven o'clock. This or touches so. upon what I want to say about Heinrich, right? I've known this man for about five six seven years, and. The knowledge, the wisdom, the experience he has beats most watchmakers that's worked in the industry for 30 years. Why? He's lived it and breathed it 24 hours a day for 15 years, 15, 20 years. You, you compound that, right? If you're doing 20 hour days, 18 hour days, you're not a normal watchmaker. You've met people, you've done stuff, you've made mistakes. He's done, I feel like he's done everything in the books to make him the man he is today. And this guy doesn't have a gray hair. Look, look at his hair. He, this, <laughs> I stress more than him. <laughs> and I have a workshop, I have like a bunch of people to rely on me. Like, look, look how relaxed he is. I may not work 18 hours a day or anything, but, but I feel that all my time goes into the watchmaking. So some days I might only work 10, 12 hours a day or whatever. It's not only. that I'm stressed out or anything. It's just I have I have an abundance his, of time his because 10, I'm not twelve else. hours working as a watchmaker is not I'm gonna fix this detent this this detent I'm not gonna fix this escapement it's how do I fix the jewel on the the palette the how do I fix a palette how do I even out a palette jewel how do I make stuff more efficient how do I how can I mass produce these Valju seventy two uh, movement springs right it, it's it's high level conceptual stuff that he comes up with and then his school is essentially the research it's like anybody could have actually done it because think about it I don't have any um, I, I don't really care so much about friends it's thanks uh, <laughs> oh thanks <laughs> yeah. in my face sorry, sorry. Oh, oh okay no no but honestly cheers yes. Anthony cheers Anthony uh, honestly my priority is always to learn more and more because I'm very curious about how things work in the watchmaking world. His, or, curiosity, or anything. his curiosity is to make watchmaking more efficient, yeah. grow it, to ensure that... How to make it better and faster. Yes. He's done stuff that machines do, that he's like, this is how you reduce it by hand. Right? He's done that research. He said, he sat there like, how do I make this look like this? Right? I've been in the workshop where there's cows. Ooh. <laughs> he's like, hey, look at this cow. I'm working on this. And I'm like, holy shit, dude. Really? And it's like, yeah, this is this is it. Right? He'll sit, and then 12 hours a day, he'll sit here and try to manage and figure out how can he make his students' life easier. Right? Yeah, and that's the yeah. important part, right? Yeah, yeah, you try sure, to make sure. people's life easier, better, and try to reproduce results. That's my main thing, yeah. 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 My main main thing, what I like to do now, is to, to research about um, how to make, uh, for example, spare parts in restoration. Mm. That's a huge topic. In a, in, in a very is. easy way that everybody can do it with less skills. And it's quite fast and competitive. And, and it must, of course, the quality must maintain uh, top top quality of course that's what interests me today how, how can watchmakers around the world in their daily situation uh, make a hammer for a Valjo 22 for example and I had Jack over a few weeks ago and then I did this concept with a pantograph uh, together with um, 
uh, profile projector. Yep. And I just had an idea, let's try this. And uh, I only had one student at the, at the time. So he, he became the pilot student for this uh, this first uh, course. And we took a risk. It's a guinea pig. Yeah, <laughs> guinea pig, yeah. yeah. But uh, no, no offense, student. You're, you're doing well for the industry. Yeah. <laughs> now, is that something you teach in your restoration course as well? or? Uh, well, I don't really have a... Well, I, uh, Wait, no, I guess it, it's a it very new concept. It depends on where you're at. And, and by the way, I'm not the only one who do this. Yeah, the idea came first people. from George Daniels, uh, George Daniels book, when he was spoking out wheels with a pantograph mm. as an idea. Uh, but now there are Japanese watchmakers who actually uh, cut out parts with a pantograph, and yeah. also Austrian, Swiss, yeah. and, uh, and German and so on. So I was thinking, yeah, if they do that, but there's no school to teach that, I have to bring that back into the school and show Where what, what the, yeah, uh, and, and it's this is a growing, growing thing. You have to be able to like learn to do the measurements. Yeah, right? yeah. You learn exactly. to get the, the, the stuff right. So, okay, we veered really far from what we discussed originally. Going yeah. back to your progress, right? Right now, you've just left both step. You're charting out how to grow from where you're doing. What happens after most of them? Where do you go next? Do you have the experience oh, yeah, working yeah. with complications? So I was working for this company with the complications on four hour a day to, to get the money uh, to buy uh, equipment uh, tools. E equipment that's, and tools for again, restoration. That's every watchmaker's dream. Like we all save up money to buy lathes, to buy chip boards, fucking machines, exactly. Collets, like you name it. We save money for tools essentially. Like it, my issue with my workshop, I'll never make money is because every time I we make enough, it's like Oh, which he has this new time machine that I need to buy. That's like eight, yeah. nine thousand dollars. Like that's where the money goes, right? Like yeah. it's a never any trouble. In a part, if something goes, God forbid, something's wrong with your Swiss timing machines or your microscopes or your or water yeah. pressure machine. Which costs a fortune. It's a couple yeah. hundred dollars for a freaking part, and then the shipping, and then you can deal with customs. So, okay, it's a thing. I'm not going to go into this. That could be another session where I complain about. The state of how much yeah, everything costs. Yeah, yeah. But going back to what you were saying, uh, what were I saying? You now? were talking about how you were leaving most that oh, yeah, working yeah. So to save I, money to buy. Yeah, I got a rare equipment. opportunity then. Uh, okay. So I was working. I knew that I was coming to the end with uh, with the foot trading course, okay. and then I was just uh, thinking of finding a regular watchmaking job in Chris or or whatever companies do, who's oh, wow, doing an interesting. You were, um, that, that was my plan anyway, but um, but I never got to that stage because my uh, my manager or boss at that time in this company which I produced uh, uh, the watches for, he asked me, oh Henrik, would you like to open your own uh, watchmaking school like was but in your own regard? Uh, and I was thinking, uh, yes, yeah, that's a lifetime. I mean, opportunity. Uh, a lifetime opportunity. I mean, you, I mean, it would have been stupid to say no because economically he would have also supported me throughout the entire process. That's awesome. And that was really awesome, yeah. And um, and it, it's supported through a foundation, not not from yeah. the company itself. Yeah, right? yeah. So yeah, it's, it's clear. Not, it's not corporate. It's not. Yeah, it's, it's not for them. It's like a tax write-off. It's like how yeah. Rolex has well, the Rolex Foundation here. For them, it was probably not. Yeah, I'm a tax write-off or or not. It was also. Uh, I think it was actually a real passion behind the people. Mm. Who, who wanted to do it. It's okay. not like they just want to save money or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it, it, it's really that they honestly wanted this uh, money to go into higher education of uh, watchmakers because they see it as an art which needs to be protected. Yep. And uh, sure, sure enough, I, I took the chance immediately and uh, and uh, how I went with my own school. That's how KHWCC started. Yeah. started. Yeah. Okay, so explain the name. Uh, the name came up in a, in a meeting with uh, the people who were involved from the foundation and me. And uh, at the time we were also two other watchmakers uh, who, who helped me. I was supposed to go uh, with one of my friends in a refresher course and another teacher from Vostep at that time. Okay. And we decided to build that together. Uh, but it's a long story why I'm the only one left today. But yeah, it's it's uh, we can go into that in another video. video. <laughs> anyway, it's complicated. It's using my line. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Any, it's anyway, fast, man. it's not anything bad or anything. It's it's just <laughs> it's it life. didn't work. It it's didn't life. work out people, people, at that moment. It's um, like people move on. Yeah, and and not everybody have the possibility to participate in something this large yeah. and and kind of risky. 
very, no, very risky. Because we didn't know that this is going with 120 percent risky. If you have a family, I'm not sure you wanna, you know, put all your eggs yes. in the basket. I had nothing to lose, so it was obvious why I have to take Frame this shot. all or nothing. Yeah. Take Vegas, yeah. baby. Roll yeah. the dice. Yeah, exactly. It's good. And uh, then off I went in 2009, I started to build a school. Basically, immediately after uh, I graduated the, the, the full training in um, in uh, Boston, I went off wow. to build uh, to, to okay. put install all the uh, machines in the building and so on. How how do you how much was that? How much time did it take to like kind of build everything from scratch? I know you had an idea from Mosa, but there are ideas that you I'm have. I'm sure right, that, that you was the. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I already had, the ideas were already there because I have worked five years in Boston. So everything was crystal clear what I wanted. And it has remained exactly the same today. We have just added tools since we started it. And it turned out to be a great concept and it's just uh, growing and growing every year. And uh, we probably invested some, something between, I don't know, six, seven, eight hundred thousand, if not close to a million Swiss francs in tools. Wow. It's like a super school. Wow. For only six, uh, five or six students in two classrooms, and, and to be fair, it's a niche uh, space. His school, not this, his school is for everyone, right? If you want a job, if you want to go to watchmaking school, get a job. Listen, there are plenty of watchmaking tools out there that you can go to for two years, a year maybe for a technician course. Leave, get a job. But if you want to really get into the like weeds of watchmaking, and I don't mean this to sell Heinrich, like by all means, like I respect you as a person, I respect your skills. I took courses from him. I yeah, took course yeah. from you, yeah. right? And I felt like that's benefited me a lot as a watchmaker because there are times where it's like, I need to make something, I need to make something a certain way. How can I replicate this finish yeah. in yeah. a way where I can, that the customer is like, oh, Henry didn't screw up this watch, you know? But in a way where it's like a crafted screw that looks like a watch. Like I've done that. Like with, I've sent him pictures of like, hey, uh, this is where I'm at. This is where it needs to be. He's like, oh, try this or try that. Like, you, you're yeah. giving me honest advice. Yeah. You're giving me yeah. feedback on stuff that I, I need to do as a professional watchmaker, right? So I feel like there's always room and growth for learning, whether you were starting out watchmaking or you're a professional watchmaker, you can always expand expand your cup of tea. Right? Even, even if the school, is, it's not really a niche school or anything. I had students who had no money. They were not rich or anything. Uh, the school is not it's not expensive there is a high cost in living because in we are in switzerland yeah. it's a high rent yeah. uh, and so on so but i had several students who had no money but they found sponsors so it, you there is many ways you could actually get to me you, you you even if you don't have the money you might start researching if there is any local watchmakers in your area who have a shop and maybe they want to hire a watchmaker and send you to um, to training so even if, let, let's just say like they don't have that much money to stay for too long, but I, I think you have a, re, a new program that's like... Um, uh, I have like several new programs. This year I started uh, a technician course. Yeah. Uh, the concept came because uh, there it's is still a need. Yeah, there's the still, there, there is still a huge need for watchmakers. They don't have to be, you know, they don't have to do balance stuffs and so on. But the bigger market, I think, for watchmakers is that they can repair watches. Yes. Uh, repair, repair uh, yeah. overhaul. Yeah. That that's we need more people in Pro this field. Properly overhaul. Yeah, a uh, good right. good like overhaul. A decent team. overhaul person. Yeah. And that's why I created two technician courses. One would be eight months, which has also a final exam. This final exam will be assessed by Swiss uh, uh, watchmakers, uh, so that we maintain uh, the the on the same level. Yeah. But before he even goes there, right? Uh, explain your testing procedure um, it's for similar all your to students, step. right? So yeah, his it's stringent. Like whoever the final he has, so hiring has no say at the student at the final test for the student watches. It's industry experts. Yeah, I, 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 I don't role, check that actually. Yeah, who, who inspects the watches? That we can't really say, but yes. Oh, it's shit. it's uh, yeah. So we have to edit that out, <laughs> oh, but it doesn't matter. Uh, so I have people from either. Dude, that's uh, that's, the way, that's all right. Yeah. Um, so there you are have industry high, guys. You wait, have industry wait, guys examining. It's not normal industry guys. These are high level industry people who are reviewing these final student pieces. Yeah. And they're reviewing such a level where like these are high complication watchmakers who work on really expensive. It's like tier one. You know, it's okay. like 
So, Hybrid, do you, do you actually examine these, or do you a lot? Do you let no. these guys? No, check they, they being, check everything yeah. according to what they think is good watchmaking, and therefore, I would like to hire uh, people from the Swiss watchmaking industry who work with the things that I used to be working with, because that's where I draw the inspiration from. High but company. I don't want to check that myself. So these, so it these doesn't guys make are, any sense. So these guys are practically getting peer review. Almost as if, like I said, a medical medical field where other people are reviewing their work. Yes, it was the same in Vostep. I took the inspiration from Vostep. I don't wow. want to check my students' final exam. It's bias, do, right? Yeah, it's, it's bias. bias yeah. It maintains autonomy in the whole. Because yeah. if someone, like, someone, if someone asks them what's the testing criteria, it's like, oh, this high level brand, this really high complicated watchmaker who works on all this stuff, tested my student. And this was his result. So if there's a question, you go to this brand and you, you question, you question, right. you question their results. Yeah. yeah. So your students, I know your students actually get into a lot of high-end uh, companies that they're actually sought out after, correct? They go everywhere. Go Independent, uh, famous brands, groups. But the uh, technician course that you have out allows them to actually repair watches and get certified. Um, not with enough I understanding yet as a complete watchmaker? It's not a complete watchmaker. Yeah. There is no micro... Well, there is one no. month micromechanics in the eight months course, but it's just to warm up and give some sort of introduction that they can make simple tools. Like if they want to make a Horia pusher or anvil, they can actually do that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Okay, and so this uh, is a nice intro class for them to get into watchmaking. I think in, 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 in many uh, regards, we, we, I, I believe that it's going to be uh, in the future seen as it's almost like a watchmaker in, in uh, many countries actually, yeah. uh, where they don't do as extreme high end as in Switzerland. In most countries, I think this technician uh, course level would, would be regarded as a proper watchmaker. Oh, that's awesome. I and think, that's eight I think months, only, only eight months. But it's, it's intensive, intensive eight intensive months. Eight there months. are uh, there are several. Uh, um, Exams, intermediate exams. The intermediate exam, I always check, uh -huh. and I'm, I'm, I, I try to be as strict as possible okay. so that they get ready for the the more scary final exam. So, um, one of the questions were, um, what advice would you have for uh, new and future and upcoming watchmakers entering the field, and and kind of what are your thoughts about the field, of, uh, the industry now for them as they come out, because. It's a small field, and you know, there's only a few entering the the industry, and um, do you, there's do a lot. Do you mind if I take this first? Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. So, for people who want to do watchmaking, who's interested in it, find watchmakers, chat with them, go to their workshop, pick their brains, bring them out to coffee, go for drinks, ask what a typical day to day is for them in a small shop, ask a watchmaker who works in a Richmond, a Swatch group, find out their life. Find out a life person who works at FP Journ. Like, just do your research, right? Do your due diligence. That's number one. Second, there's a ton of information online, right? Go to YouTube. Go to Google. There's people who write blogs about building stuff, about writing stuff, about how they built their first watch, how they got into watchmaking. There's co online courses, right? There. Again, I don't want to name drop, but there's courses online that that show you basics, fundamentals. Of watchmaking skills, but it depends on the person who's teaching it, how in depth they go, what the principles they're teaching, and this falls in later in our conversation about the concepts of teaching, right? That's about like the first two basic levels: do your research. Second is go online and find out what you can, because if you spend a couple hundred dollars on a course, on an online course, it's better than wasting a couple thousand or, or, or maybe twenty, thirty, fifty, or maybe even up to eighty thousand dollars to find out. If that's the right path. If that's the right path for you. Yeah. You have to go to, let's say, Switzerland, or have to yeah. go move to Florida, or move to Texas if you're in the United States. Um, for that, that's, that's kind of the final stage is like to make the actual move if you want to do it. And when you do want to do it, make sure the school you're going to is the correct school for the path you want to take and want to take it. And I, I'm prefacing this because there are schools. That will take you for two years and teach you what his school can teach you in six months or seven months. Right? Yes, a lot of people think that the the, the duration in school equates to quality kind of and no. skill. It doesn't. Yeah, right? no, it's, it's it's the research 
thoroughly, ask former alumni, ask people who recently graduated, ask people who graduated in the past, because I know of schools in the past where there were very highly esteemed instructors who kind of spearheaded the school program, and then when they left, the kind of the school kind of like degraded and kind of yeah, became yeah, yeah. this former shell of what it originally was. Yeah, but they still have the good reputation. Yes, because yeah. of course who saw it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's my spiel on it. Right, Heinrich, what's yours? Uh, so I, I start I started watchmaking in nineteen ninety five. Uh, or the watchmaking school actually in nineteen ninety five. And it has only got better. So if you hear people complaining about the watchmaking state and so on this is, this is not uh, good advice because it's not really true. I've been around since 1995. The only thing I have seen is that watchmaking is just becoming better and better every more year. Efficient. More and more. It, is more complicated. It, it, is, it is ridiculous how interesting this profession today is. Yes. You can do, there's so many opportunities for all of us and you can almost choose what you want to do. But, but what uh, when I started watchmaking, the only possibility you had was to repair old watches. That's it, vintage or, uh, watches or whatever. Quite boring. But now you have all these independents, but not only the independents, let's not forget the larger industry like Rolex, Richmond, and Swatch Group. They also make a lot of more interesting products. They're hiring more watchmakers. And I don't, I think it's a little bit unfair to, uh, to, to uh, criticize uh, the industry. And I don't think it helps much either. Uh, because if you look back in the past, watchmaking has never been as great as it is today. It is. It, it, it's. It's amazing. I what, think we're what at find the pinnacle of where we should be as a lot as, yeah, as watchmakers yeah. because it's only going to be better. Also, because in the look at look at all the technological growth and, and and enhancements that we've had with technology, right? Yeah. Like parts that used to be handmade, for like for weeks and months, now can be done in a matter of like. Seconds and minutes. Sure, sure. Right? Also, that's the technological yeah, advances, yeah, right? Yeah. But you would require some of the hand finish it afterwards, depending on the level of competency yeah, of that watch. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean. And then you have the total handcrafted or handmade watch. It's very, very rare pro product. But there are a few watchmakers around the world who also do that. And then we have the CME handmade watch, where some parts are completely handmade and, and uh, some, some are machine. done machine, yeah, for example. Yeah. I mean, and then a lot of hand finishing. That's what you see a lot typically in, in You have everything industry. represented in this industry today. Yes, right. It has never been as interesting as it is today. All right, so Heinrich, for, for those watchmakers who actually just graduated school or um, who are just entering the field, um, and they look at the industry kind of a little bleak, and uh, what, that, what, what advice do you have for them? Uh, yeah, then, then uh, you're looking at it from a, from a very wrong uh, perspective. It's mm -hmm. not bleak at all. Yeah. It's only positive. I don't know what kind of details you're focusing on, but it, it seems to be just details. You have to get on maybe on some sort of an overall picture and take, please take in, take the past in because if you compare to the 19, you know, 1980s watchmaking compared to today, um, there, there is an enormous difference. Uh, yeah. And I know that many people are complaining about spare parts, uh, accounts and so on. Well, then move away, if you don't <laughs> like it, move away to, to another brand. You know, it, it's, it's um, I don't know, uh, I don't really 100% understand the complaints. You're in the US, uh, he doesn't know about the FTC and the Federal Trade Commission yeah, and how it was handled. So right now there's a case, I don't want to be current, but like there's an ongoing battle that they're finding out whether or not it's legal that these brands are withholding parts, not allowing the U.S. market to service and repair U.S. market pieces, and ensuring that it has to go back to Switzerland yeah. or wherever the origin of it is, because that's essentially a monopoly. Yeah, right? that's, yeah. that's market yeah. control over yeah. a product. Where, from the brand perspective, I understand, but from a from a, as an independent watchmaker, it's it's not. As fair if someone brings me, let's say, a high-end piece, I need to go to a brand, and obviously I would show my workshop, I would show my credentials, I would show what I can do, I would show where I've worked before. There'd be a whole backstory and ensure that the company knows that I can handle the timepiece with my credentials, with what I've done in the past, with the workshop in mind, but that's still not a thing. It's still very tightly regulated by um, the industry because of because
because of their rules, right? Essentially, like, I mean, we've all had the Swiss sent you a letter to say, like, this is, you know, not, you can't do this. So, you know, it's kind of a cease and desist. So what can you do? As a small, per as a small yeah. workshop owner, I, you know, I don't have the, the, the clout that they do. Um, I used to work with them, right? I used to be a watchmaker under them. Yeah. So I know kind of like the ins and outs of a lot of things, but yeah. Yeah, so for newer watchmakers generally, I think the easiest step is to get into like places where they have parts available and that they're authorized. Yeah, or work for just independence. So can, yeah, exactly. Or work, yeah, work as independence and, and yeah. just really get your hands on experience with them. Or work inside of a Rolex, inside of Yeah, work one. inside for these companies. And so that also works. Too. Do everything. If you start There's watch so making, many possibilities. Do everything. Like, yeah, yeah. Do, like you run into issues with a watch, just work on it. Just do yeah. it. Like it's a, it's gonna be a constant thing where it's like some stuff you don't know, but that's where you learn. We, yeah. If something you run into that you don't know, that's where the growth begins, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah for sure. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. how many times you sat there looking at watch like how do I do this? Yeah, no, right. you have to figure it out. Whether it's like how do I open this watch or like how do I fix this watch? Yeah. Oh, excuse me. You have to figure it out. Yeah.